Um, Cause I've heard about things like alpha fold and protein folding predictions. Is that, you know, any sort of relevancy when it comes to quantum computing? Yeah, that's what I just said. You know, the, the, you can potentially go from, you know, if you have an amino acid sequence and you want to predict its fold, you know, we were at sort of 90% accuracy or whatever, these are arbitrary units, um, relative to the gold standard, which is X-ray crystallography, right? Now, X-ray crystallography is laborious. You have to set up experiments. You have to use beamline. It's, it's not fun. Some proteins can't be crystallized, you know, but at the end of the day, X-ray crystallography isn't that expensive. Um, and it's still done, you know, for, for obvious reasons. It, it sort of reflects reality pretty well. Um, so if we go from 90% to alpha fold, which uses machine learning, not just physical, um, laws, but machine learning to determine protein structure, that's maybe a little bit more accurate at 95%. And then the gold standard is the real McCoy is hundred percent. Maybe quantum gets you to 99% or something And that. I'm being generous to, to illustrate the point, which is let's say it gets to hundred percent or 99%. What's, what's the benefit? Well, drug companies would inter start to integrate it in their drug discovery routines, but drug companies already only spend a hundred million on drug discovery software. They're not going to all of a sudden start spending billions. Um, nor are these companies going to be the ones to make the software. There's a lot of the, these efforts around, and I just don't think you need a quantum computer because a lot of drug discovery optimization happens in the lab and quantum can't really help you there. And obviously it can't help you with any clinical trials. So the little part of, of medicine that's drug discovery software, it's just such a small field. And to upgrade to a quantum computer for millions and millions of dollars, when I could just click a button on my GPU and do it for free, you know, it really, it's really hard for me to imagine, you know, that being worth it. Plus it's a small market share. And I can see that being a, not a really exactly a great bulk, bulk thesis for quantum uh, bulls. But what do you think of like finance and risk modeling? So like, you know, faster Monte Carlo simulations or, or, you know, optimization of, you know, portfolios or credit scoring, fraud detection. Like I've heard all these big buzzwords and um, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on those things. Yeah. So we're getting back to another problem that also applies to drug discovery, which is where do you load these variables? So right now it's, it's extremely hard to even, the machines don't have the storage capacity. So at worth throughput. So just to put in the chemical descriptors of like protein and it's, um, and it's uh, state is very, very, very tough to do. And you'd, you'd have to sort of keep that in a separate state and then sort of spoon feed the calculations to the quantum computer, but you'd still ultimately need, um, to put in lots of coordinates for the many body problem. And it's just very, very hard to do. Um, so the same thing applies to, Monte Carlo, where, okay, if I have 8,000 stocks and I want to run a linear, you know, uh, approximation on those stocks, a linear combination of factors, great, but, you know, how do I do that without loading all the weights in somewhere? So it ends up being this really difficult problem. Um, and, you know, what, what I think the real quantum scientists, and I talked to a lot of them, <clears throat> are excited about is, can I get, you know, a, um, and our, our SNU is making a point here on the chat. Can I get a, um, can I get these things to do anything? Right. Can I factor a number? Which is like this really elemental thing. And then we can worry about, you know, use cases down the road, but for now, you know, you know, just getting it to factor a number, which is like intractable. That's really exciting to computer people. It's exciting to physics people. It's, it's really thrilling, but the idea of like doing financial Monte Carlo on these machines is like more science fiction than reality. That's probably 50 years away. Um, just getting, just solving a 300 digit RSA that's still, you know, kind of out there. And again, if we can see that in five or 10 years, I'd be impressed. I do think it's going to happen. Um, uh, I want to stay on the forefront of this for somewhat obvious reasons I've discussed in the past. I am um, very curious how this progresses, but um, so far we're a pretty long ways away and five to 10 years is kind of ambitious because we still have a lot of 
errors to deal with. So just, you know, putting in a 300 digit number is how many bits? Does anybody know? How many bits is that? Shouldn't be too hard to figure this out, right? Let me ask, let me ask ChatGPT. How many bits do you need for 300 digit number? This is like Ted Cruz. Um, okay, 1,000 bits. Um, so right now, there's no computer with 1,000 qubits. Um, so you need the number in, in memory, you need the program in memory, and you need room for like ancilla bits and stuff like that. So I'm not short circle, but I... <laughs> Things crazy. What are your thoughts on like logistics and optimization? So obviously, like you've mentioned, like the traveling sp uh, salesman problem. Um, you know, I don't think those companies are going to spend billions of dollars. But do you think that there is any sort of leeway as things get cheaper to produce, whether it's the content computer or, you know, you outsource, you know, cloud space? Like, is there something that can be used in terms of like, is there future in this? Yeah, I mean, so right now, you know, there's no. There's no quantum computer that could do any of this stuff, but assuming that, you know, some of these problems are solved with fidelity and RAM and stuff like that, getting bandwidth to and from um, the processor, the QPU, um, you know, there's a lot of data that goes in those calculations that constantly needs to be like changed slightly. Um, and right now, like the, the bandwidth to and from the chip is, is very, 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 very slow. And in fact, the chip's calculations are quite slow too. And recalibrating the chip for new calculations is really painful. So I, I, it's going to be hard to get these things competitive because even if they can do the problem faster, well, the approximations are, are very fast on silicon. And they can basically just, they're instantaneous. And you don't need to reset or error correct or recalibrate you know, ions in space. You just go. And you know, that that's the power of silicon. But of course, you know, there are some powers of, of quantum too. So, you know, I think that uh, it remains to be seen. It's like very speculative. But I will say that like Jensen has said, he said on the on the quantum uh, quantum day at, at GTC, he specifically s sort of sneered at the um, uh, at the uh, issue with um, traveling salesmen. He said, we, we have great approximations. We don't need more approximations to traveling salesmen. And again, you know, I think that, can I see a future where 30 years from now, we figured out how to put gigabytes per second of bandwidth on a quantum, on a QPU, and we figured out how to calibrate instantly, and we figured out how to do all that stuff? Would, would some work move there? Absolutely. You know, I, I think that one of the problems is I'm not sure that day will ever come, one, and two, I'm not sure that's a big, um, valuable use case. Like if I'm Amazon, I have to sit there and wonder, okay, let's see if I'm spending, you know, $500 million a year on logistics or I don't know, a billion dollars a year on logistics. I have this number actually, that's sort of savable. Like my orchestration of it is only a part of it, right? I actually still do have to pay people to to move things, but let's say I can make it a little bit more efficient. I have an Amazon model here. And you know, keep in mind, this is the biggest company in the world. Fulfillment's 54 billion for Amazon in 2030. Right now it's 40 billion. <clears throat> let's say they can make that 10% 10, 10 more efficient. That's $5 billion they can save. Um, you know, quantum computer is something they could build themselves theoretically. And you know, the, the market's not, not infinitesimal, but again, assuming that, that all these technologies come together such that they could do it, it's just one thing that'll assist in optimization. Um, they already clearly do do optimization. Um, it'd be good due diligence to ask some of these optimization experts, where do you see this playing a role, if ever? But, you know, I think that, you know, the biggest bang for the buck is 5 billion. Obviously, Amazon's not going to do it for Five billion. You know, they want a return on it. So maybe they do it for a hundred million or five hundred million. Um, but they're not gonna do it for they're not gonna pay five billion to save five billion. And um, you know, 
the competitiveness of like Silicon getting better, <laughs> you know, is, is something to not forget. You know, I, I think in 30 years, um, whether it's probabilistic computing or just NVIDIA and their pathway, I'm not sure that even when we get there for quantum that that delta is going to be five or 10%. It may be, it may shrink to nothing. And, you know, I, I wouldn't trust the future that much because we don't know what's going to happen. And NVIDIA is not stopping, right? They're accelerating. They're still going to be here. We can get the answers to these problems really, really easily. So I feel like, you know, it, it's sort of a lot to bet on because, you know, we haven't seen that speed up. And I feel like, you know, until, until somebody from Amazon says we can save billions of dollars this way, and so can every other shipping company, it still would be an overvalued sector because like, as I mentioned, the amount of money spent on logistics and the amount amenable to savings, like maybe you could get a little bit more efficiency out of a worker, but you're still paying that worker. Um, so the route's a little more efficient perhaps, but they are doing that now, one. And two, like, you know, shaving a few seconds here and there will, it does add up, but I still feel like there's, you know, minimal upside here. Um, just because I think I've heard you talk about like cryptography, um, regarding, you know, quantum and, you know, you know, cracking RSA, maybe ECC, maybe factoring discrete logs. So it's, you know, there, I'm hearing that, you know, it can be very useful for cryptography, but, um, you think we're anywhere near maybe 10 years down the line from cracking these sort of things, or is it just like, we are so distant and we're, you know, you can, you can put only so much information in a quantum computer can't really handle these bigger problems yet. Yeah. I mean, so for factoring the, the, the amount of information is very little, right. And that's what makes factoring so cool is that it's a 300 digit number, but if you were to try to factor it, it would take you till the end of the end of time to do it, which is really neat that if you wrote that number down beforehand, you say, oh, well, here's the answer. I had it all along. And it's basically nature's password, you know, which is really, really cool mathematically and scientifically. But uh, so quantum computers don't need that much information. As I just said, a thousand bits will give you this, the world record factoring problem. So you don't need, you know, a lot of qubits. You know, we already have 150 qubit machines in IBM's cloud. The thing that you do 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 need is getting um, high fidelity, so you can actually run the experiment. But I think those problems will start to get solved. There is an outside chance that it just can't get solved. Um, there are some people that think that. I'm not in that camp. I'm I'm an optimist. <laughs> um, as crazy as that sounds to some people, like I am an opt intrinsic optimist, um, but I'm not a fool. Um, so I believe that we, we will be able to control matter and harness quantum effects to do calculations. But, you know, the complexity speed up is really important here, you know, to go from the exponential class of problems to the polynomial class of problems. Polynomial time is, is tractable, exponential time is not. Um, so that complexity shift is really important. And, and the only class of problems that has proven complexity shift is Shor's, which is, you know, the, the integer factoring in essence. So integer factoring, is not useful to anybody other than code breakers, hackers, maybe nation states. Um, but I, I see, I can't see for sure, right? But with sustained investment, meaning quantum doesn't go cold again, because it's had the cold, hot cycles. It's been around two cycles now of winter and, and spring. And we're in, clearly in spring right now, but I, I assume we'll get to winter again soon. Um, you know, I see if you assume just sustained investment nonstop without the, the breaks, I could see in 10 years, we could, we could crack state of the art shores. And that's a big thing. Shores has been around 50 years, you know, um, GCHQ, which is the UK NSA had shores before shore. I'm sorry, had shores before RSA, RSA, Rivets, Shamir and Edelman. Um, they, um, published their groundbreaking RSA paper. I think it was 1979, but, the, the hackers and spies at, in Britain, the Brits had it in 1975. So the obvious thought here is that, you know, these weren't independently discovered. There were whispers about this and they made it to MIT and MIT professors quote unquote invented this. Um, 
you know, just a funny backstory about it. I don't really, it doesn't matter that much. But RSA has stood tall for 50 years. Now, by the way, you can make key sizes bigger. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a pain in the ass that occurs, but we're on 2048 bits. So 2048 bits are, are big. Um, that's double, that's like a 600 digit number. So if we go to 4096 or 8,000 bits or something, you can even outrun quantum computer. Um, and then of course, lattice-based cryptography is already getting standardized out there. You know, it should be as simple as a pip install, npm install uh, package at some point. So I, I could see very, very soon, you know, people start to implement lattice-based because it should be as simple as implementing RSA. Um, so I think that, you know, everything will be fine. Bitcoin will have to go through some interesting transitions, but the death of RSA is not that crazy. AES kind of died. Um, so, you know, it, it, th these things do happen. Um, and, you know, there's a first time for everything. Technology is definition by definition the first time. So RSA will have to disappear, I do think. But I'd be surprised if it happened in the next five years. Um, I would not be that surprised if it happened in 10 years, but I also wouldn't be surprised if it happened in 15 or 20 years due to the nature of funding cycles. We're at an all time high of funding. Mostly it's going to AI, but we had a really, really large funding kind of peak that may dissipate for many years. And in those years, companies hunker down. They don't really do much research. Um, especially smaller companies, Google and IBM may, may be undeterred, but your smaller companies are wondering how they'll survive. Um, eventually winter will thaw, but you can spend five years in winter and lose five years of progress. So I, I would not be surprised if it happened in